You're listening to Resist and Restore, a podcast from the Circle of Hope Pastors where we are extending the table of our dialogue. I'm Johnny Rashid. I'm Rachel Sensenig. I'm Julie Hoke. I'm Ben White. And a very, very, very happy Festivus to you. It is Boo. December 23rd. <laughs> And Frank Costanza is celebrating Festivus. Does everyone know I love Seinfeld to like an extreme degree? And it could be what nourishes my soul every week. I don't think you've talked about that enough on this podcast. Jeremy. I'll get to that later then. We're going to end our Yule show. Happy Yule, too. Happy what now? H- Happy Yule. What's no, Yule? Let's get, what is Yule? The Northern European Festival of the Winter Solstice. That it's Santa Claus and elves and reindeer and snowmen. It's a great holiday. I love that stuff. <laughs> I love it. I love it all. Um, somebody, somebody say Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, yes. everybody. <laughs> the Resistance Restore podcast is a, is fighting our war on Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> no, I no. Just for the record, there's no war. They're just all great holidays. Festivus for the rest of us. Yule, Christmas. It's my favorite one, <laughs> but they are not all the same thing. That's my point. They're all good holidays. We're going to end with spiritual show and tell, speaking of which, but we're going to start with some talk back. Julie, you heard from someone that you know that responded to us. Lead us through that. Yeah. <clears throat> my friend from my cell uh, was listening to our podcast and reflecting on our conversation from our cell that week and, and wrote to us about this idea that repentance is communal. Johnny, you had gotten us thinking about that. In contrast to the Western individualism uh, that that shapes this idea that repentance is an individual act, she was really working with with your idea that repentance cannot be done something done in isolation. And she, she wrote and said, even if we need to repent from harming ourselves in some way, we need community to support in our own healing. What do we all think about that? Mm, I think that's so powerful. I think she's really on to something. And I just had a friend, a very brave friend, do that with me yesterday, calling me saying, I'm going through this thing and I need somebody to know about it. So so we talked and, you know, we're going to walk next week together Um but I think we all we all need that kind of sharing with each other what our struggles are so that we can help each other. Yeah, because we need to see it. Um, it, 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 might, it might be effect, like when we repent, you know, God is God's steadfast love is never failing and his mercy extends forever. And, and we could uh, this is a perennial problem in theology and in the Bible. People are talking about this all the time. But I think that one of the main reasons we need community is so that we can see it and be seen. You know, Johnny was talking about the difference between guilt and shame. Uh, from a Western perspective, we have a more individualistic, guilt-oriented society. And he was bringing up his Eastern roots in Egypt and how shame is more of a communal bad feeling that might motivate transformation and repentance. And there's just a different angle that we're coming to this on. And, you know, the Bible is an Eastern tradition. Um, so it ha- it's definitely more, uh, it might be, if it's in line with Johnny's experience, which I think it probably is closer, um, it's a, uh, a more shame-oriented, honor-shame orientation versus guilt and innocence. And experiencing the shame is something that is really helpful. I think this is how humanity works and might be covered over by the Western individualism, that being seen in my brokenness is something that I need to experience. And that's why confession is so important in the New Testament. Confess your sins one to another, it says in the book of James, and then you'll be healed. Like And like have the power of healing, it says in the book of James. And pray Mm. one for another. Yeah. And that's that's what Rachel was doing as she listened to her friend. Mm. But I have experienced that. It's a difficult, like, kind of spiritual muscle to go with, you know, the, the humiliation of it, honestly. And Mm -hmm. and that's something that, of Mm -hmm. course, we we totally want to avoid, but it's really healthy to experience that humiliation and the forgiveness that's going to come with it, to trust the other person, to imbue upon you the forgiveness of God and their forgiveness. Mm. Um, They said it. I see it. I I had that moment, that just tiny moment of humiliation, and then I was freed from it. And the freedom on the other side of that, you don't get that feeling unless you go through, we would say, a, a communal lament, a communal repentance where you're seeing in that. 
And not just the freedom, Ben, but the love that you feel from that other person. Like they still love you. It's so shocking after you say the thing that you're struggling with and, and you get like an I still love you kind of response. It's like, we need that. That's amazing. In Psalm 51, after David rapes Bathsheba and Nathan confronts him about what he did and he kills Uriah, and it's like really terrible, he writes the psalm. And in the psalm, he says, I've sinned against God and God alone. It's a song, psalm of lamentation. You could get the impression that all you need to do is say that, and then that's where the, rec- the repentance happens. But I think that, for one thing, when you relate to God, you're not in isolation. There's a relationship happening there that David is intimate in. And also, the dude is writing a psalm that a lot of people will sing and experience. And so there's something communal happening there. There's something public happening there. And so I think it is a difficult thing, especially when it comes to Western-oriented Bible study, because you read that psalm in your room by yourself, not in public worship. You might miss the very communal aspect of this, um, even relationship with God. Isn't he also recognizing that his sin against other humans is a sin against God. Mm-hmm. It's it's not just a dismissal of those he has wronged and, and harmed. It's, I think, a bigger recognition of how wrong that is to harm one another. He used God's enemy to cover up his sin by killing Uriah. I mean, he did a real, he did a terrible thing. And like, there's the, the depths of that. This is a whole nother podcast, but the layers of his <laughs> sin and thus repentance are extensive. Future podcast. Yo, David was really, 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 really bad. (laughs) (laughs) And yet God loved him. And he was a man after God's own heart. And uh, he he experienced the forgiveness on the other side of that. Johnny, you were saying um, the other day about, though, even if you can only muster an individual repentance, we're not dismissing that, right? No, we're not. You know, you're not in isolation when you're relating to God. Even if you can't get out of your own hovel and you, you're you just crying out to God by yourself. God is there with you. God is part of this community and making a community with you even when you are by yourself. I And I think that you strive to have a, um, a relationship with God where a confession does not feel individual. And I think that you learn to experience God that way. You know, I'm a, I'm a church guy, so I think you learn to experience God that way in community. But I think that the community teaches you how to relate to God by yourself. If that makes sense. It, it, no, I, Julie was going to say something. She probably will clear it up for me. <laughs> uh, well, I was going to add in a little different direction. Do you want to ask that question first, Ben? Well, say it again. That last sentence kind of threw me off, Johnny. Say it one more time. When you surround yourself by people who relate to God regularly, you learn to do so. Mm. Is is <laughs> is the is is the basic idea? Mm-hmm. So being in community helps you relate to God because you're seeing other people do it, you're seeing God in them, and then you can take that and then have your own spiritual life and intimacy with God. I see. And and, and, and you can experience the reality of your communion with God. You actually are having a a more than an individual experience when you're alone with God, and that's reinforced by the community. I understand now. Yeah, and I was just going to add that 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 repentance isn't just about feeling better. This communal process and this communion with God – and one another changes us. It conforms our heart. It transforms our heart into more of who God has created us to be. Yeah. We become ministers of reconciliation, it says in Corinthians. And then we can do this work in big ways too. You know, the community starts to expand. As much as the individual starts to to grow and transform and be bigger, the vision of that individual gets bigger and, and the hope for transformation gets bigger as well. So why not have a racial reckoning in the United States of America? Why not tell the truth about the history Mm. of enslavement and Native American genocide? Why Mm -hmm. not um, have a vision of of love and reconciliation that stretches across the centuries and across the whole continent, maybe across the whole world, have hope Mm. that big? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I guess we're doing a big, big, huge both and there. But the community starts to grow 
your your sense of communal repentance, if you, if you can get beyond yourself, it starts to exponentially grow. And then you have a sense of the whole world and you actually are part of a body of Christ that extends throughout time and space and into eternity. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Let's let's end with that. Well, no, we can't we, we can't end with that actually, Julie, because I have to make a confession. Oh, um, uh, Here's your our, communal uh, confession, bro. Yeah, our our friend um, wrote us about. They didn't name it, and I, we they uh, Julie, Rachel, and Ben. Uh, Julie, Rachel, and Johnny all said it was Ben that did this thing, and I was like, <laughs> No, it wasn't me. I would never do that. <laughs> But it was me. We went and found it um, on um, an episode, a recent episode. I, I, I pulled up a an entry on our our trans historical body blog. Speaking of being part of a you know over the centuries body of Christ, Christoph Munziwa. I couldn't say his last name. I just pulled it off off the cuff, and I did, and I skipped saying his last name. Like his name's Christoph. I'm not even going to try his last name because I don't know how to say it. And that See, is we such... avoid names that we can't pronounce. That's the difference between you and us three. Just, yeah. Oh yeah, I just I just went thing. headlong into this. I didn't think about it enough, and I did. But I did the thing. I did the dang thing that is really important to particularly immigrant people in the United States. Their names get jacked up all the time, and it's like a whole thing. And I I participated in in that by skipping Christoph Munzi West's name, and uh, I went. I had to go look it up. I had to watch a video to figure out how does one say this name from the Congo. And I, I did. So go back and look up his story. He's a great peacemaker in the Congo where there's mm -hmm. been so much violence and Jesus has been present through him and his followers. And he's a beautiful man that we're remembering on our trans historical blog. I'll put his, uh, his entry from October 29th. That's the day he died on our show notes. Thanks, Ben. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for writing to us. Um, we appreciate all the talk back we get. So please write to us uh, with your thoughts and we will feature it here. Resist and Restore podcast at circleofhope.net is where you do that. I'm so glad you listened to our podcast. It's good to connect with you. I want more people to hear our podcast, and one way that you can help with that is by giving us the best review you can on the platform that you listen to this. Just turn it up to 11 wherever you listen, and then more people somehow will see that this podcast exists. I don't understand how, but I believe it. You can also share money with us. Circleofhope.net slash sharing is where you do that. Sharing money with us helps with the whole church and also with the podcast. And... There's a place if you want to specify why you're sharing, you can write that in right on the website as well. I invite you to pray with us daily at circleofhope.net slash daily prayer and slash daily prayer deeper. And to worship with us on Sundays, we meet at five at circleofhope.net slash online meeting. This podcast is being released, like I said earlier, on Festivus, December 23rd. And if you're an avid listener, tomorrow, the December 24th, we have two opportunities for worship. 3 p.m., a time for Christmas Eve for families, and then 11.15 p.m., a Christmas Eve candlelight observance. Now, if you listen to this in the new year even, you know, I, I hope that um, you still have that spirit with us, but get to those live events tomorrow um, because I don't believe they'll be recorded. No. Nope. So, one-time opportunity. Gotta Thanks be again there. for listening. You'll be there, Rachel. Thanks, thanks for listening again. Email us at resist and restore podcast at circleofhope.net. All right, another year is over, and it is time to do the yearly examine, the thing we do every year, right, y'all? Never done it before. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, put yearly examine in air quotes, everyone, because we made a cool little joke about the daily <laughs> examine. I don't think this actually works as well if, as the daily examine, which Ignatius of Loyola invented as a spiritual practice for his disciples. And we have become his disciples, many of us, in using this daily practice of, of looking back on our day and tracking the motions of our mind and heart and seeing our lives with Jesus doing an imaginative walk through what happened in the last 24 hours and seeing what God was doing in our life. That looking back allows our life to actually happen to us and allows Jesus to happen to us in that moment. The big words that he used were desolation and consolation. When did you feel farthest from God? When did you feel just abandoned and alone? 
if you ask that question every day, you might actually realize that you're feeling that way often enough. Of course, it's a scale. You know, you don't have to be, you know, totally down in the dumps to be um, disconsolate. So that practice is important um, to to have Jesus be with you in these the the deepest moments of the day, the the darkest moments of the day, relatively. And then the other consolation. This isn't like when you were elated and you you were floating in the power of the Holy Spirit up into the seventh heaven. This is just the highest moment of the day when you had a, had a strong sense of God's presence, maybe, or you you felt really loved, or there was that moment when the birds flew from the tree and you, and you felt like you were connected to uh, the creation. Uh, looking for moments like that, or you know, even when your spouse, you know, actually did the thing that you wanted that you were too um, tied up in knots to ask for. You're looking for this consolation, th- these moments when you're feeling good, you're feeling loved, you're feeling connected. So desolation and consolation, it's really great to do this every day. Like if you had 365 days of the daily exam, you'd probably be able to do this exercise that we're about to do <laughs> and probably better than than each of us because I'm sure that some of us uh, didn't do the daily exam all day and that, all, all year and that's fine. So, But we're doing the yearly exam where we're looking at the whole 2020 and we're saying, no, it wasn't all desolation. And there were moments of consolation, but there were moments of desolation that we want to bring up. So each of us is going to share one moment of desolation and one moment of consolation and try to help you um, feel your way into it and hopefully create some space for you to do the same. Maybe you'll be feeling the same thing we're feeling. Maybe our example of doing this process with 2020 will, will help you to do it. That's our hope because we want God to be with you and we know that God is with you and mm. we need to experience that. Do you want desolations or consolations first, Ben? Let's do desolations first so we can end on a high note. But they don't erase each other, right? Like just because That's I right, got consolation yeah. doesn't mean that the desolation is like presto changeo. So I regretted it right after I did it because it, it accentuated and specified my desolation. Walter Wallace, a Philadelphian who was killed by police in West Philly this year, I'd follow the story. I read it. I knew it was happening. I was engaged in uh, counter responses and so on. But they released the body cam footage. You know, the police have um, a camera on their body, and I'm and I'm uh, I'm ready to watch it. You know, mm. and seeing it recorded because I I had seen the video recorded tons of times before that. Where it's like the cell phone, cell, footage. Cell phone, yeah, video, cell phone yeah. footage from the guy's car. They're seeing the guy. This is different because you're in the killer's body watching it happen. Content warning for you. It's, it gets graphic. And the cop gets out of the car and the situation is intensifying. There's neighbors out in the street. The cop probably has in mind um, this person has a knife and there's all these people around. I don't know what to do. And then there's a moment and the mother's outside walter's mom's outside containing her son who's having a breakdown and then one cop tells the other shoot him like it, it, uh. it, it, they said the words out loud and then that's what they did it wasn't even a you know it wasn't uh. even impulsive you know you thought about this and then you said it and then did it and it's horrifying, man. It is horrifying. And my desolation is deeper than that because the manifest evil that's in front of me. And I feel I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm saying this act is evil. The struggle that follows for our church and our society to collectively lament about that is really hard. And it pierces me because I feel isolation to an extent, in that experience. And I want to avoid it. I don't want to see this stuff. I'd rather, and maybe, and, and, and to my own benefit, it may not be best for me to consume these things all the time. But I think entering into the pain is something that I did in that moment, and it tore me up, man. Mm-hmm. And it, it, in, in that pain, there's definitely a feeling of hopelessness. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's definitely desolation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks for for bringing that up, Johnny. Are you saying that that um that you know said so the deeper is that like you're experiencing this different than 
for example, me who, who's white. I think so, Ben. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that's part of the, de- of the desolation is that this is so horrifying. And, and yeah, it, I can say it's horrifying to me, but I'm with you. I'm not experiencing it the same way as you. And, and I'm not experiencing the same way as, you know, a black mother or a black man. I'm not black either. And so I want to, you know, I'm brown. I've been mistreated by police because of my skin color. That's a fact, but it's different too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, I'm with you in that, that uh, desolation of that different experience that, that hurts me too. I want to bridge that gap and it's very, very difficult. Well, I'll follow um, with my desolation because uh, my desolation is also uh, framed in the that gap that you just named, Ben and Johnny. When I was considering this, my year in review, what came up for me was a, um, a relationship uh, that I don't I don't have anymore. there was there was a moment, where I was talking with my Asian American friend, she and I were getting to know each other, working out how how to relate, how to um, work together. And I, I said something to her that I distinctly r- realized I was missing. I was missing her, and I was trying to figure out what happened in that conversation later. And I was talking to my husband about it. And as I recounted how it all played out, the moment of desolation for me was when he reflected back and he said, oh, were, were you essentially saying it was like, it was like a, a Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter moment? And I was like, what? And he, he reflected on it more. And the desolation of that moment for me was like, I just wanted to deny that. No, that is not what I was saying. No, that is not what I was doing. You know, I wanted to defend my intent and give him more context. I'm sure he wasn't, you know, he wasn't understanding what was happening. Uh, but actually he had a pulse on what was happening in a way that I had completely missed. And it was like a gut punch in my stomach to realize that I had missed her and her experience so distinctly that I would never have considered that I was essentially saying that to her. Um, And it was desolation in having to face my shame in that and having to own that my experience as a white person in our society is so different than her experience as an Asian American woman that I was completely oblivious to the impact of what I was saying. And I had to take responsibility for that. I had to go back and repent. I had to own up to that. And it w- it was it was hard to do. Mm-hmm. It was hard to see in myself and admit that I could cause that harm to someone else. Yep. Yep. I've 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 been there too. And I'm I'm hopeful though that white people are ready to submit to the experience of our, our non-white friends and brothers and sisters and continue in that reconciliation process. That's reconciliation. We were talking about that earlier. And even if it's not complete yet, we must continue and walk down that path. Well, that's true, Ben. But I think that hopeful note is like, I, I don't even want to jump to that because in this moment of desolation, like that's what I want to sit with, that it's hard to experience that and stay stay there long enough to be changed it's too it's too easy for me as a white person to talk myself out of it justify what i meant you know whatever there's lots of defenses to it but i think the desolation is that it is the ways in which our white supremacy has shaped me and our society and my experience in our society in such a way that i would I would be so able to miss her and her humanity and her experience and what she was trying to tell me and, and, and dismiss it that easily and, and move on. Thanks, Julie. How about you, Rachel? Well, I'm already judging my desolation here now, listening to my don't, don't do sister that. and brother. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> 
Mine feels so much more selfish or something. It's different. It's different. I I, mm-hmm. I have a, I had a preview. I I want to hear this. I think this is part of people's experience too. Well, my desolation is just like sadness from missing people, especially over the summer, realizing that I was so sad because I miss I miss my people, our people, um, particularly like gathering for worship together in one place. And um, it was really affecting me. Like I was like losing weight. I was just kind of wilting. I, I had a moment on the beach where I was, you know, laying, laying in the sun, my favorite thing to do ever and realizing I'm still so sad. This is not even like, this isn't even like making me happy. <laughs> Because I miss our people. And uh, kind of the pinnacle moment of desolation for me was uh, recording a Sunday meeting. We do, it's a live stream. We do them live, but I was looking into the camera and trying to communicate something. And just the grief about saying something into this camera was just overwhelming me because I, I hate. I hate talking to a camera. Like I just wanted to see our people's faces and have that interaction and the talk back and like the responsiveness that we have with each other when we're together. It's, it's, uh, it's dynamic and speaking into a camera in a room alone by myself was just totally not cutting it. (laughs) And, um, I remember feeling like Jesus really saw me in that moment and, he was even saying to me, like, of, of course, you're sad. Like, you're you're a shepherd and you can't gather the flock and you can't touch the sheep and be, be with your flock. And um, so that, that comforted me a bit that Jesus understands. Uh, but still, it's been hard not to be able to be together in person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel that too. And but I think you got uh, an important piece of the of the yearly exam or daily exam is that Jesus is with us here in that. So as we're sitting in this desolation and remembering it at the end of the year, a key piece is that Jesus is with us. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jesus comes up in my my desolation moment because part of it was that people were putting his name in their mouths and they were lying. There was this crazy conjunction moment where I was on another video call because that's where I live my life. I was talking with pastors and faith leaders from around the the world, actually. People from like New Zealand and the UK and Canada were on this call. And they were all very interested in what was happening in the United States because they had just exonerated Breonna Taylor's uh, murderers. Uh, Breonna Taylor was killed in a no-knock warrant. Uh, they knocked on the door, and uh, the her boyfriend thought that it was a an intruder. They didn't announce that they were the police, and he fired one shot at a police officer and hit them in the leg. And then the police officer that were there filled the whole apartment with gunshots. And this happened quite some time ago, but it was more recently that um, the only charge that was put against the officers was reckless endangerment for bullets that went outside of Breonna Taylor's apartment. So this is an incredible miscarriage of justice. And I was fired up about it. I was talking about it on Facebook, which is always, you know, just a bad idea. So I made, I made several posts just kind of just stating the case, the facts of the case, just saying like, this woman was murdered. This can't happen. This is wrong. And Christians came out of the woodwork to tell me that, that I needed to respect the truth, that there were there were witnesses to the contrary, and that someone did say that they announced themselves as police. <laughs> and my point wasn't even that uh, you know in this conversation I was having on Facebook, my point what my point was this is excessive response. You got shot in the leg, and then you fill the whole apartment. Kill the person with the gun, maybe. I mean, I don't even want that to happen, but aim. You know, you're you're a, you're a trained gun wielding police officer. And you shot everything so that Brianna got killed in her bed. That's crazy. That's wrong. That can't happen. So I'm really fired up about this. And I'm on the call. And, you know, it was weird. Like, it was just happening. Things things like this happen where you're on the internet. You're on your computer and everything's happening. So, like, 
I'm on the call with my, with my friends from around the world trying to pray. And just before I'm like sparring with this Christian guy telling me things on Facebook that are just making me so angry. Then I go to pray with, you know, you unmute and you pray <laughs> and it just all just poured out of me. I just started sobbing with, with these friends from around the world that I don't know that well, but it just kind of like I was, it was, it was a lot of anger and it was sadness, but it, and it was a lot about Jesus and who he is and how we can be so different and how you can come at me with his name saying that. How is this possible? How can he, like, how could Jesus's name be so impotent? Like, how could you miss, how could you miss him so clearly and be coming at me in that way? And then I, and then I don't even like the feelings that are coming at me. I hate you. I hate you, brother, who calls on the name of Jesus and is coming at me on, on Facebook. And I hate that too. I hate that I hate you. So, <sighs> That's the desolation for 2020 for me. And it, it it ties into, you know, a year of racial reckoning and a year of uh, continuing to champion the truth about uh, the way our, our society is set up and the way our laws are set up, the way our police is organized. And it's really hard to do. And the pressure is really high because we can't be together, like you're saying, Rachel. That's why that's important. If, 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 if I had y'all <laughs> being, being with me and loving me um, and kind of reflecting back to me the Jesus that I see in the gospel, and I wasn't just alone on the freaking internet, mm. with this liar, I don't know. I might not have. Mm -hmm. It might not have been the same. I might have had more hope in that moment. I don't know. Mm. That's desolation. Jesus is with us in it. Thank you, Jesus. But it wasn't all that. It could be all that. Um, that would probably be enough to Jesus be with us in the in the desolation. That's worth doing. It's probably avoided more than anything else. But we also have to receive the love of God. We also have to see that that is not the whole story. And this isn't like a paper over. This isn't the thing that should ascend and let's think positive thoughts. But God was also with us this year. Let's tell those stories as well. Then the, the racial reckoning that you're touching on was my first instinct for a consolation. It feels really hopeful that this work is starting in a new way. That's been happening throughout so much of the year, and Lord, may it continue to happen. Um, but if I had to boil it down to one moment, I have to tell you that my daughter got baptized this year in quarantine in Woo! our bathtub. <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> um. And beautiful. it was beautiful. She had had an, an encounter with God at camp and um, found a faith that was clearly um, her own, like beyond what her dad and I and our community have hopefully saturated her in. But something was happening for her and Jesus together that was new and different um, maybe a year and a half before this moment in quarantine. And she, she's been, she had been working that out ever since. And so she wanted to be baptized, but then here we are in a pandemic and I don't know which, I don't know who among us said we could do it in our bathtubs, but uh, there we were and we, we did it and we were able to still be together in it because we were talking into the phone camera and Johnny was hosting and uh, some of our friends were also doing it in the, in the river, but it was really beautiful to see um, my daughter's faith and her courage at being willing to share it with, the, with everybody else mm. in the middle of a pandemic. It was so good. Corey Grace, love her. My consolation came uh, through my family also uh, way back at the beginning of the pandemic. We, um, it was Holy Week. And as a community, we take uh, the journey of the Stations of the Cross. It's this meditative journey that um, just leads us in this the suffering love mm -hmm. in the way of Jesus on his way to the cross. And 
We had to creatively reimagine that in a pandemic. We usually do it together as a community through throughout our neighborhoods. And I took that journey with my family this time, uh, which I haven't been able to do. My kids are always in school. Um, so we, for one of the stations of the cross, we climbed out our front window and sat on the front porch roof of our house and watched the traffic go by and read the scripture together and took a moment of um, pause and reflection. And that moment, I hope they remember. I know that I will. Um, the whole journey with them throughout our neighborhood, down the block, around the corner to certain, you know, different points helped me to see Jesus in right here where we are in the midst of this moment and with with them my consolation came out of uh, actually a, a daily exam in practice uh oliver my my 10 year old uh had this moment of realization at the dinner table that he wasn't going to have any kind of party for his birthday he just turned 10 and he was just he was so sweetly sad uh he he often in his frustration or his when he's uh desolated it comes out almost primarily as explosive rage, <laughs> like, and so I'm I'm not usually able. I'm, I'm I usually am always having to push against that, but this came in this kind of sweet kind of I don't know what better word to say, but pitiful kind of like oh, I'm not gonna have not even with the cousins. We're not gonna get together at all, and he just melted into his mom's arms and started to cry, and I told. Um, I mean, I, I reflected on that and, and had written it down in my journal and it was just on my mind so that I, I shared it with someone, Bob Brown, he needs to be named. I shared it with him when I was with him and his wife, Anita, and it's just like, yeah, you know, how you doing? I'm like, yeah, this kind of sucks. You know, I, I was just feeling this thing and, you know, I'm feeling for Oliver and Bob just snaps into action and he, and he, and he organized Hmm. Um, dozens of people to come to our house for a birthday parade. You know, we had a, we we were just going to do a super low key. This happened in December when the pandemic was smashing down on us again. You know, and we're like not doing anything, and we're just content. We're just going to have to make the best of it. Is the plan? Give him the presents we bought him, and try to celebrate him. We decorated his room. It's just going to be a family thing. But. Bob organized people to come, and it was a total surprise to Oliver. And people just kept coming. Johnny came with Elaine and Agatha, um, hmm. and lots of other friends came and threw candy. Oh, the, the, I, I don't, they might, I don't know if they organized this, but tons of people threw candy at us. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was almost like a pinata uh, in the front yard. He's picking up all the starbursts, and people had decorated their cars. I mean, of course, this is one of the cool things about the pandemic is that this has happened many times. These birthday parades, but they had kind of petered out you know like it was like a resurgence of the of the birthday parade and it was a total salvation mm. of oliver's birthday i mean it's pro probably the best birthday ever now that's the best <laughs> birthday ever i really like birthday parties like i, I like <laughs> i like to go way big on the theme you know and I, I didn't really do any of that and you know this disconsolation that i shared with a friend with a person in my in my congregation became maybe the best birthday ever maybe one of the most memorable moments of his life when I was 10 in the pandemic, all these people came. It was a surprise and they just kept coming. That was part, that was the part. They just kept coming. They weren't all there at the same time. They just like, oh, there's more, you know? And it was just so joyful. And, and he was so happy. He was so mm -hmm. happy. And the, the, the contrast was just amazing. March 15th was the first Sunday we were in online. We didn't know what we were doing. We met in a room together and thought that was safe. No masks, we're just hanging out. Okay. March 22nd, we thought, oh, maybe a little bit more distance is good. We're in the middle of Lent um, and we're still online. We moved to a different location. By the next week, we're all in different rooms at home doing a live stream that way. But it's Lent and in Lent, we observe communion every week in Circle of Hope. And we're thinking, how do I do communion? Can you even do? But the first two weeks, you're not even thinking about, you're just getting through. You know, and maybe part of you is like, yeah, communion is part of this, but how are you going to do communion, you know, without intention? We must, <laughs> you know, you got to dip the bread, you know? Um, and so I think I say, no, we got to get to the, we got to get to the cross on Sunday. And Ben comes up with this great idea. 
to send people off away from the stream, collect some food and drink to represent the body and the blood of Jesus. Now, this is all within, relatively within bounds of our theology, but it still stretches us. You know, but for me, you know, even though it was a donut and water for the body and blood, which, by the way, beats like stale bread and juice, but just in terms of the food. Come on, donuts. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, you know, at, at the risk of sounding irreverent, the ingenuity and the creativity of that moment helps me. Can it changed my life really? Um, I was just reflecting about this, and I thought, no, the table means something, and you got to get to it how you can. You know, a pandemic can't stop me from getting to the foot of the cross and receiving my salvation as I declare the death of Jesus again. Mm-hmm. And, you know, at that moment, I thought it was March 29th. It was nine months ago. We're going to get, we can get through this. You know, and I'm, um, I'm consoled by that, by that moment. Who knows what new things will come after this, but that's my consolation. Oh, uh- I will never forget that communion either, Johnny. And Ben, you led that one, didn't you? That's right. It was a, it was a surprise too. We didn't um, we didn't warn anybody. It was just like, okay, this is how it's going to work. Go do it. Yeah. And so it was a little bit exciting too. And people were sharing what they were. What you know, Johnny had a donut and water. Some I remember someone had a seed and like apple <laughs> cider. And someone said, Jesus, the seed in the in the in they were put, sharing it in the YouTube live chat, and I oh. thought that was so good. Yes. Totally. Yeah. They, had a, they had a nut, you know? Uh, guys, I, I know we're out of time, but your vulnerability inspires me so much. Can I just add the heart of my consolation? Mm-hmm. Um, when Corey was little, she would always say, you know, at bedtime when we'd be reading stories and singing and praying, she'd always say for years, I don't know what you're talking about mom and dad, like, I don't know. I don't feel anything about God. You guys are in circle of hope are always talking about God. I don't feel this. I don't get it. And I'd always comfort her that it's okay, Corey, you don't have to feel any particular thing. Like someday God will reveal God's self to you and you're on your own journey and it's okay. Don't worry about it. Years later, it really happened. And she and God hadn't, God did reveal God's self to her and she had this encounter. And so that, that was really the heart of the celebration for me. So good. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I hope that everyone listening has the opportunity to do some reflection. Um, You know, maybe you'll have some time off between Christmas and New Year's. That's often something that happens. Sorry if you're stuck in retail every single day, but carve out the time to, Mm. to think it through. Even if you don't, you know, or, or, or create a practice of daily examine. Uh, my friend was saying that she got an app that helps her do this on her phone. Um, so there's the, you know, there are ways to do this and to create this kind of journey with Jesus, to, to participate in the journey with Jesus more consciously. And, uh, I really, really want that for you. And uh, I think you can, I think you can do it. So our last section here today is called Spiritual Show and Tell, and this is the time where we talk about what's been nourishing our souls lately. So take it away, pastors. I'm going to bring up the Life for the Life of the World podcast with Miroslav Wolf at the Yale Center for oh, Culture and Faith, I think it's called. Um, he had an interview recently with Ivan Mawarire from Zimbabwe. He's a Pentecostal pastor who started um, protesting against the Robert Mugabe regime. He had been president for way too long since independence of uh, Zimbabwe when it switched from Rhodesia to Zimbabwe. And this Pentecostal pastor, Ivan, he got arrested and then he escaped the country. And then he went back because God called him back. And he got arrested immediately when he went back to Zimbabwe, got right off the plane, got put in jail. And he talked about his experience in jail. And he said, my freedom is something I already have. And he was taught this by a young man who was, who had been converted in, in prison 
And this pastor was just kind of despairing, like, I'm stuck here again. This wasn't, why did God, why did you do this, God? And this guy comes to him and says, why, you can't wallow like this. <laughs> you know, these, these walls, if they're going to, you're going to serve two life sentences. If, if you, if you don't, you know, one in your mind and one in your body. So, you know, you, you have something to do here and God put you here for a reason. And he experienced that, that his, his experience was not confined to his imprisonment. And obviously he's out now uh, the, the, and Mugabe fell, fell and no longer is uh, the leader of the country. Um, so really cool story uh, from Ivan Mawarire. I spent some time pondering Michelangelo's Pieta um, at the encouragement of my pastor, Rachel Sensenig. Rachel, when you talked about um, Mary's faith and her open hand, I went back to that sculpture later in the week. Uh, you talked about it at the Sunday meeting, and I went back to the sculpture and and just spent some time pondering it. And what stood out to me that moved me so deeply is the the details of Christ's body and how her hand is tucked under his arm and um, the way his legs are draped over her lap. It drew up in me so many human emotions about mothering, and it really helped me to identify with Mary's grief, my own grief, and the grief of humanity, and and also helped me hold my hand open to God for the miracle. Thanks, Julie. It's my guy uh, who nourished my soul, Andrew Yang, this week. Yeah. He's been a friend of mine for a long time, and he's one of our best songwriters. I'm I'm completely partisan about that because of our friendship, but I do love his songs. You're um, objectively correct. We <laughs> <laughs> <I> agree. <laughs> and he, he wrote this beautiful Advent song called The Heaven's Praise, which is really what is about to happen tomorrow night as our Lord is born. This line, he, he sings, Like a child's arms up to embrace, like a flower eager for the rain. And he says, I am waiting, do not leave me here. Though I'm crushed, I rest on my deliverer. He sings it beautifully, but these images of waiting are just so piercing to me as I await too. Yes. Oh, Johnny, thank you. That's what's been nourishing my soul is this, this posture and returning to this rhythm of resting on my deliverer in Advent. And I realized again this year that it's so it's so easy to get out of that practice. Like I, I began Advent feeling like I have all this time this year because I don't have I, I you know I don't have the parties to go to and and mm -hmm. um, the the extra traveling to see family and friends and and I thought I had less to do. But you know as the season goes on, I always. I have this great desire to, you know, make things for everybody I know and love and want to, you know, let everybody know how much I care about them. So I, I can like come up with all the things and really get out of that posture of actually communing with God, which, you know, the Advent is this invitation to like receive the indwelling mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit again to let Christ be born in me. So so especially recently in the past couple of days when I feel sort of the, the stress and the expectation mounting in me and I feel tired and, and my lists are growing, I'm returning to that invitation to, to rest on my deliverer, to light my candle, do the daily prayer, um, and actually be with God. So maybe I'll do that into the evening tomorrow night. Um, we're going to light our candles on Christmas Eve, we can even put the link um, in the show notes here that you could join us from wherever you are. And we're going to wait again for the light of the world to come to us, and He will come.